Well, today is Easter, and we have spent the last several weeks following Peter and the other disciples on the road to Jerusalem. Last week, we witnessed Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But a lot happened in that one week between Palm Sunday and Easter. And so before we read the text this morning, I want to just recap the events of Holy Week for you. On Monday and Tuesday, the conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders escalated. On Wednesday, Judas met with the religious leaders and arranged for Jesus' betrayal. On Thursday, Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room and shared the Last Supper with them. Later that same night, he was arrested while praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Early Friday morning, Jesus was tried before Pilate and sentenced to death. By Friday evening, Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. Saturday was a Sabbath day of rest. Only seven days had passed since the triumphal entry, but so much had happened in between. Now, Sunday morning had arrived, and everything was about to change. So listen now for the word of God to you from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. And returning to the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother, mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I heard a story that one preacher got up in the pulpit on Easter Sunday and announced to the congregation that he had three sermons. He said, good people, I have here three sermons, and he held up his papers. I have a $1,000 sermon that lasts five minutes. I have a $500 sermon that lasts 15 minutes, and I have a $200 sermon that lasts 30 minutes. Then he said, let's have the ushers come forward and take up the offering, and we'll see which one of these sermons I deliver this morning. <laughs> I had thought about trying that today, uh, since today we are dedicating our pledge cards, but I thought I'd just tell you the story. But you know, it is hard to preach on Easter. You might think that this is the preacher's favorite Sunday with all the, the decorations and the fantastic music like the choir just sang, with all the people in the pews and flowers, all the singing and, and the celebrating of the resurrection. But I've got to tell you, it is hard to preach on Easter. There is a lot of pressure. However, it is also, and most of all, an honor and a privilege as well. And this morning, we read Luke's account of the story. Now, each gospel writer gives his own kind of spin on what happened 
the third day after the crucifixion. Matthew has Roman soldiers guarding the tomb who are thrown over by a great earthquake and then the sudden appearance of an angel. Mark has the women wondering how they're going to remove the stone from the entrance. John's story is much more mysterious, with Mary Magdalene coming by herself while it was still dark, and there is anticipation as to what will happen when the dawn finally breaks. But Luke, Luke is rather kind of matter of fact about it all. He tells us that at early dawn, the women arrive at the tomb with a job to do. They had brought special burial spices along with them. And while they had a pretty kind of grubby, ordinary job, we can only imagine what they must have been feeling. They did have hope at one point. These women had been with Jesus through a lot. Countless healings, the feeding of the 5,000, the Sermon on the Mound, the raising of Lazarus, and, and many, many parables <coughs> about God's grace and love. And it was this sort of whole new kind of life where anything is possible and there is no limitation. But now, now their hopes had been shattered. All their, their dreams and their optimism had been torn apart. Jesus was dead. What they then discovered when they reached the tomb was beyond anything they could imagine. The stone was off to one side, and the lifeless body that they expected to see was nowhere to be found. Instead, there were these two men, these two strangers in dazzling white clothes, and they said to the women, Who, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember what he told you. Remember. There is that word again. John used it this, uh, in the same way in our text from last week, if you remember that, with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he was talking about how the disciples, they did not yet understand. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. One of my favorite theologians and authors is C.S. Lewis, who wrote a series of children's books you might be familiar with called The Chronicles of Narnia. And of course, the most famous book in the series is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But there is another called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Anybody read that one? Anybody? Oh, okay, got a couple. Well, it is about a little girl named Lucy who reads a beautiful story out of a magical book. But part of the magic of the book is such that she forgets it almost as soon as she has read it, even though she tries really hard to remember. We're told that from then on, whenever she liked a story, it was because it reminded her in some way of that beautiful, magical story she had forgotten. Later, when she sees the lion, Aslan, the lord of all the world of Narnia, Lucy asks him to tell her again that beautiful story. And he replies that he will be telling it to her over and over again for years to come. Luke tells us that the women did indeed remember. They remembered that Jesus had told them that when he came to Jerusalem, he would be arrested, that he would be humiliated and tortured and then die, but that that would not be the last word. He would rise again. He had told them all this, but they did not understand it at the, at the time. Now, now that they remembered, it suddenly all made sense. So the women went back and told the disciples everything that they had seen and heard at the empty tomb and all that they had remembered. But to those men, locked up in that upper room, scared, ashamed, and guilty, 
the women's words seem to be just an idle tale. Some translations say that they thought it was just nonsense. One paraphrase reads, they thought they were making it all up. And so to them, to the disciples, it all sounded just like a bunch of rubbish, simply impossible. And I don't know about you, but I can understand this reaction. I understand how the testimony of these women sounded merely like an idle tale, like empty talk and utter nonsense. Because we do this all the time. We live in a world where seeing is believing, right? We focus all of our attention on just coping and putting up with life's injustices and unfairness. And we don't look for the resurrection in unexpected places. Just like the disciples, it seems impossible to us. But thankfully, not all the men dismissed these women. There was one exception, good old Peter the Rock. Now, we might expect that after denying Christ three times, Peter would kind of cower in shame, that he would run away in an attempt to leave his past behind. Instead, when he hears the news from the women, he gets up and he runs to the tomb to see for himself. And when he peers in to the empty tomb and sees the linen cloths just lying there, Luke says he was filled with amazement. Now, I can't think of a better reaction than that, can you? Dr. Caroline Lewis said, the resurrection only makes sense when we remain amazed, marveling and wondering at the love of God that reversed death itself. Resurrection is not an idea around which to wrap your mind, offering se sense to a, a, a confusing world. It's not a theological debate about the different ways to interpret this text. Resurrection is an experience. It is an experience of being amazed at the most wonderful and unexpected ways. <clears throat> and I have seen this right here in Green Acres in my five years with you. I have seen resurrection happen in your lives. The times when you face terrible pain and then one day there is a sparkle in your eye, and I know that the resurrection has happened for you. I've watched you move through times of struggle and great darkness, and then one day notice that God has visited you with some healing, and there is joy back in your lives. Resurrection changes everything. Our losses are not forever. Our tears are only temporary. Our disappointments do not dominate us. And our darkest moments are never too much for God's light. Peter shows us that just when we think that our stories have come to an end, God surprises us again and again with signs of the resurrection. So while preaching on Easter is hard, the message is always clear. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. So friends, believe this good news. And like Peter, may we too run to the tomb with hope and respond to the resurrection with awe and amazement. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.